Welcome to Keeping Up With Data. Keeping Up With Data is the podcast that keeps data enthusiasts up to speed with what is happening in the data world. We bring in the leading minds from the data industry to talk all things career, news, embarrassing stories, failures and successes. So something really important for us here at Precision Sourcing is mental health. It's something we've been focused on a lot over the last year or so. And we're lucky enough to have partnered with the Black Dog Institute. And we're going to be doing a lot of events with them this year. A lot of our events, money will be going towards them. And they're out there aiming to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. So if you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link in the bio on this podcast. And you'll be seeing a lot more information about Black Dog over the next year. So welcome once again to Keeping Up With Data with myself, Joel Robinstein. Emily Noda, right here. And today <laughs> we are very happy to be joined by two gentlemen from Ashurst, um, Bikram and Avi. And as always, we'll get you guys to introduce yourselves. So maybe we'll start with you, Bikram, you're in the room and just tell everyone a bit about who you are. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Bikram Chaudhary. I'm a director within uh, the data and analytics practice at Ashurst. And I lead everything that's data governance, data management advisory work that we do. Got about 13 years of experience spanning across Europe, uh, India was born and raised in Australia the last five years, doing a lot of data governance and data privacy uh, across industries. Nice. It's a very hot topic at the minute, so we'll definitely dive into that. And then Avi, we've got joining from Melbourne. Tell him a little bit about yourself. Avi Bagarwal, so I'm a director in Ashes Risk Advisory. Um, and yeah, data is something that I've worked and lived uh, all of my professional career. Um, and uh, specifically more around financial risk and compliance analytics. So that's that's something that I specialize more in. Um, I have experience across Australia, uh, multiple cities, uh, Melbourne, and Canberra, a little bit of Sydney as well. Uh, worked two years in London, uh, which is quite good and exciting, and uh, also worked and led some projects around the APAC region uh, in my previous role. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us, both of you. Um, so today's episode, we will get into some of the usual stuff, just who you are, you know, I guess where your backgrounds were. But I think what's really interesting about today's podcast is how Ashurst are building out their data practice, being attached to what is the oldest law firm in Australia. Is that correct? Yeah, 200 years old. So I'm pretty sure that people are going to be interested to know how does the legal side fit in with the consulting side of the business as well um, and Emily obviously you've been working with, with both these guys for the last year or so and you know that generally when you speak to candidates about it it's a pretty interesting proposition for people. Definitely I mean I could harp on about it but like every single person that we've placed or interacted with has always ears per- prick up and they're like oh interesting how are they doing that and they're quite like eager to hear more and I know I don't like to like bag on other companies but Big four doesn't te- technically doesn't get that kind of response. You know what I mean? It's quite, a, oh, you know, I hear all the negative stuff, but Ashes is the opposite, so that's good. Brilliant. Well, let's get into that. Let's start there with today's podcast because you both, I believe, came from, you know, big four, large consulting style backgrounds, right? So maybe we'll go with you, Avi, first. Um, am I right in saying it was PwC and Deloitte? It was Deloitte and PwC, yes, you're right. So tell us a little bit about your journey into consulting and obviously you've stayed in consulting and then what the step was like moving to working for Ashurst in a different environment? Sure. Um, So I guess my journey is a little bit interesting in that sense. So uh, having studied at Monash University here in Victoria, um, part of my degree course was something called the Industry-Based Learning Program, IBL. Uh, So I was fortunate enough to be actually placed as part of that program at Deloitte. Um, So what that means is it's kind of like an internship for six months. I happened to be placed as a part of the data and analytics team within Deloitte. Uh, And at that point in time, they were starting um, an initiative, uh, which was being more formalized in the sense of uh, applying analytics in the audit world. So as you can imagine, audits uh, has been same and was the same of you know, for quite a long time and technology was something that was really being used in that space, especially analytics. Um, So that was the team that I kind of joined in um, and started applying analytics uh, in that space and was just fortunate enough that, you know, I really enjoyed that, uh, you know, and one of the reasons for that is because I do have an accounting background. I love accounting. Mm -hmm. I love data. It was a good mix of both. So it kind of worked perfectly in that sense. Um, And then, yeah, just, uh, I guess, you know, the journey took me to PwC. Uh, where uh, you know they were starting on a uh, on a similar 
uh, phase in terms of uh, applying analytics into the audit world, uh, where I happen to develop, you know, some of the solutions and tools that they still use today, uh, which happen to be showcased at a global level, which led me to PwC in the UK, where I was helping with the global assurance transformation programs for PwC uh, and leading some of the development of some of their global products, uh, which get used on the audits today. So, which is quite uh, fun and exciting. Um, and then, yeah, came an opportunity with Ashurst, um, you know, which seemed kind of all natural uh, in the sense of uh, something similar to what I've done in the past, where, you know, it's not audit this time, but it's legal, um, you know, some parallels there. And I guess, you know, uh, the vision and the strategy and what we want to do over the next uh, three, four years, you know, all kind of fell in line in terms of what I wanted to do as well and personally achieve. So, yeah, that's my journey a little bit in a, in a, in a, awesome. in a nutshell. Well, we'll get into what that journey looks like the next three or four years at Ashes. But before we do that, Bikram, yeah, similar question, just obviously where you got into consulting and what your journey was. Sure. So I've had a very different journey. I started my career with something totally different, mm. which was investment banking. So I did mergers and acquisitions and then debt capital markets for the first year and a half when I started my career. It was a long, long time ago. <laughs> uh, it was at the bank called Nomura, which is a Japanese investment bank, We're fairly global now. Then went on to do institutional banking for a year, which right. is more credit risk, relationship management, all of that, and then moved into risk and data consulting. So it's probably first two and a half years doing a lot of work in the industry, investment banking, banking. And since then, it has been a lot of um, data consulting in the risk world. That's mm -hmm. what I've done. So probably use a bit of acronyms. I think I was presenting to a forum internal at Ashes three, three months back. And I realized that everything that I've done the last 13 years can be summarized in acronyms. <laughs> There's a lot of GDPR, PCBS 239, 100 CRDS, so on and so forth. So it's been very interesting, especially working in Europe. I think European banks probably are a bit ahead in that data risk sure. world as compared to the Australian banks. So it's been very interesting delivering data privacy, GDPR, all of those things, PCBS 239 in Europe. And moving on into Australia five years back, doing all of the same things again for the Australian banks. Nice. And if you had to put into a nutshell what the Ashurst Data Advisory Practice does, what would that be? So, very good question. Thank you. Hmm. Two things, I think, that, that caught my interest last year when I was starting to look out for opportunities. One is legal-led consulting, mm -hmm. and two is expertise-driven. And that kind of caught my attention, especially legal-led, because most of the work in regulatory risk compliance has a legal component to it, because there's regulation involved. You've got a regulator asking to do stuff. And that's and, and so that was a driving driving factor behind joining Ashes last year, and since then I must say I have been wowed with her with her propo value proposition because that's very unique, mm -hmm. um, and we can get get delve into some of this uh, really doing the in the podcast, but it's very it's that unique combination of having lawyers who understand the legal implications, mm -hmm. having regulatory risk experts who understand regulations risk like an ESG, like a fin crime, having data experts like Avi and the team that we have, and bringing the three of them to provide unique solutions to clients. I think that's, that's very, very interesting. Nice. So you, actually, Emily, talking about data governance, data privacy, being blunt, it isn't necessarily what the world has seen as the sexy part of data over the last three or four years, right? Everyone wants to do data science, they want to do ML, they want to move to the cloud. But one of the things I've found it interesting when chatting to you is, as we mentioned earlier, having it attached to that kind of legal, to a law firm, it's giving people a kind of different view of it being, oh, that's actually really cool and quite interesting. So like, what are you hearing from people when you talk to them about it? Yeah, you're right. I think it's changed a lot for the good, like data governance and data privacy and all that is actually becoming more sexy yeah. because of like we've seen all the breaches and everything like that, <laughs> which like is it? All is, PR is good PR, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think people have already felt that, but now that they're like physically feeling the pain potentially from data leakages and stuff like that, it's quite interesting and people's ears have more gone that way, I think. Mm. Even, you know, someone we placed in Ashurst was like, oh, this is so interesting, you know, I really, really am enjoying, enjoying this and I wasn't expecting to. Um, and, you know, she was a bit more like statistics background and that kind of traditional data science, mm. I suppose, background. So it's definitely shifting, which is good. And I feel like that's important because we need the like strong foundations in order to do data science properly and to make an impact. So yeah, it's awesome. So Bikram, how would someone who 
is in that more maybe traditional data science statsy style background um you know what part of what you do around you know privacy governance security would someone like that maybe find really interesting and that they can actually really apply their skills to on a day-to-day -day basis it's a very very good question it got me thinking there it's i think so firstly i would also say that we do so we've got a few different offerings that we have in in data analytics at ashes so we do a lot of lot of data remediation kind of work we do analytics we do data science we do and and then what you said data strategy data privacy governance mm -hmm. all of that so we've got a variety of projects uh, that we're working on or we have delivered and plan to deliver i think the key thing is for anyone to join what we also offer is the flexibility to do different kind of projects so someone with a data science or said remediation as an example coming in can do a remediation project can do an analytics driven project after that can get into a data governance project depends on what they want to do yes. uh, that flexibility of being able to do different kinds of projects and experience that i think is, is, is very attractive from what i spoke yeah i can imagine candidates. Yeah. and avi how far do you go into that kind of data science world in terms of advanced analytics techniques the examples that you can give of cool stuff that you guys have been doing yeah so i mean and and this is this is an interesting area because um a lot of people call data science a lot of things uh, and a lot of things happen in this world which uh not necessarily are understood by a lot of business users so i think the one key thing to kind of realize in this space is um, it's not all about applying advanced analytics. Uh, and this is what I find in the market. It's about solving the need that the business uses. Now, that can be through simple means and that can go all the way to advanced analytics as well. Now, I think it's about understanding, you know, what does your user want and what is the best way to solve that? Now, you know, you can apply different lens and different things. So, for example, like on some of the projects we've gone in and used OCR technology, for example, to read some of the stuff uh, that's there in these printed documents. Now, that's, uh, you know, towards the more advanced type. And then how do you use that analytically to then produce and provide value for our clients at the end of the day? That's an example. But, yeah. you, you know, the one thing I find is there is uh, this concept of people who want to jump straight to that AI, to that ML. Yeah where the foundation isn't even there for like a simple pivot table at the moment. So I think you have to realize that, you know, you need to do what's fit for purpose and what meets the need of the business user. That makes sense. The fit for purpose piece makes so much sense, right? But everyone wants to do the most complicated when you don't need to necessarily. So one of the questions we always ask on the podcast is a good one. So which buzzwords do you hate right now, Avi? Um, I actually <laughs> was thinking about this. Um, you know, I do a lot of recently, I've been doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, regulatory compliance kind of work. So I kind of uh, find myself talking a lot about and harping about data completeness and accuracy. Those are my buzzwords, right? <laughs> and I probably talk a lot about them um, that to the point my clients get annoyed at me that I keep saying the same thing again and again. But you know, at the same time, it is a fundamental of everything that we do, uh, because if those two things aren't true, uh, you know, anything that we do is, uh, it's not going to really be true. It's a nice uh, inward look. Most people don't say a buzzword that they use themselves all the time that they actually go, oh God, I can't believe I'm still using that. Yep. So I think those are the ones that I would say at the moment. Yeah. I don't know, Bikram, do you have any? Yeah, I think you stole my stole my thunder there. Oh well, because you keep hearing Avi say it, and you're bored of it. No, I think it, I, I've been like I, the last last week. The number of times I've used data completeness and accuracy of data was bizarre. A few different few times, but I think also the and I'm trying to refrain from that as well because data has to be complete, uh, accurate, and a few other things has to be traceable, has to be governed, has to be all of those things, has to have the right risk. Really, um, Bikram loves data lineage. Oh really? Yeah. Data lineage is really I've been using a lot of data lineage the last last week as well. There you go. It's all coming out. You know, you guys are going to keep saying this these is phrases. a roasting session yeah. between you two. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about leadership styles. Really important on this podcast. We talk about um, you know what kind of leaders you are, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. But maybe we can take a step back, which I always find is quite good. So maybe with you, Bikram, first. The best person that you've ever worked for, maybe that you learned so much about that you've then implemented into your leadership style. I think a few few different people, and I've been blessed probably that way, having encountered a few different people across organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I just a couple of them uh, at Accenture as well, when I was as part of Accenture's consulting practice for a while. So a few different people there. I think the uh, couple of things, I think for me, 
inclusive leadership style is probably what I look up to and I think both Avi and I are probably similar in that way as well, which is basically hearing everyone, giving a chance to kind of let everyone speak their minds and, and just listening to people and let them bring their ideas and, and be open enough to speak out in a room and, and even challenge the leadership and ask questions. I really appreciate that. Mm. And I really want people to kind of do that. That makes sense. What about you, Avi? I'll probably add to Bikram's point. Um, inclusive and adaptive leadership uh, is what I would say. Um, I think as leaders, you need to be adaptive to your environment, but also more importantly to um, the team that you work with, uh, because uh, every team has its own, or every individual in the team has its own um, unique skill set, a unique way of how uh, they respond to things, how they perceive things. And as a leader, uh, you need to be able to kind of judge that uh, and kind of really uh, adapt your style to suit their style a little bit. Um, and that way you can actually really bring the best out you know, for, of them, but also more importantly, best out from the team as well uh, as a whole. So that's what I see it as. Yeah, we always say if you want to treat everyone the same, you've got to treat them differently because everyone's an individual. You need to adapt to each person's style and, and who they are. So that makes sense. And correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you both have a fairly similar leadership style, which is great. But obviously when you're running a team as the two leaders, often it maybe helps to have clashing styles in some ways, you know, <laughs> not good cop, bad cop, but robust conversations can happen. Do you have similar styles and do you find that that works for you or do you, do you differ in certain ways? I think we actually have a very uh, similar uh, style. Um, and I think it's kind of, um, and I think that kind of stems from, you know, when we were kind of uh, both coming into the role, um, you know, uh, I, I happened to come in before Bikram, but, you know, when Bikram was coming in, we kind of had a conversation about that to make sure, uh, you know, we're not on two different pages. Um, and I think transparency around that really helps uh, because it, it can be very hard if you're, you know, if you have two leaders or three leaders and as the team grows more, um, you know, for everyone to be on different pages and that doesn't really work. Um, mm. And that's why it was really important for both of us uh, to kind of, uh, you know, discuss that aspect of how do you see a team working? What's important for you? Um, and, you know, as Bikram kind of said earlier, that inclusiveness, um, you know, was really important for both of us, um, you know, and that, you know, that what that means effectively can mean, you know, providing everyone in the team an opportunity to be part of, um, you know, what you would typically not do in a consulting firm, you know, around business development, around practice development, around people development, as an example. And that was really important for both of us to kind of, as an example, provide to our team. Um, and that's why I think it's important to be on the same page. That makes sense. And, and in terms of the types of people that you like to bring to the team, I'll even start with you here, Emily, because obviously you've, you've worked with these guys a little bit. Are there certain personality types that perhaps not are there certain types of people that would suit an environment like an Ashurst or that style of consulting it's obviously anyone listening thinking of getting into this line of work is, is there mm -hmm. anything that works particularly well so the thing I liked about the brief with Andrew and you guys originally when we first started working together was Andrew said something around um we've hired someone that has had I don't know maybe some sort of was it Asperger's or something that they were super, super brilliant technically, but they just weren't really keen to be in front of clients and pitching and things like that. So they took that as an opportunity and a strength. And I think that speaks to all of your like benefits pages and like hiring strategies where you actually are hiring inclusively, not just by gender or whatever it is like holistic. So yeah, that's been really great. I think depends on the person and how it aligns to your values and obviously their values as well. So I think anyone could fit as long as they're open to, I don't know, developing themselves in that way, if they're a little more technical and developing them softer skills. See, that wasn't a leading question, but it's really <laughs> cool the way you've answered that because the typical answer we would get when we're speaking to consulting firms is, you kind of need that personality when you mm. are comfortable in front of clients that you are comfortable speaking in front of a room. That's just that typical way of thinking, but you know, from what you said there, Emily, there's a room, there's a space for everyone, it sounds like, at Ashurst, if, as long as you are good at something that you can do. Is that right, Bikram? And adapting, uh, adapting as well, yeah. right? Yeah. That's absolutely right. And we are very selective about hiring as well. Which, um, we've been looking out for people, uh, and then we're very selective about the people we hire, because we've got a 
certain work culture in the firm we just want to kind of ensure that we maintain that which is very yeah. open very mm-hmm. open work culture people are not afraid to ask questions they are smart they are talented so mix of all of those from a very inclusive mind having inclusive mindset as well mm-hmm. so that's why we have been very selective about hiring uh, mm-hmm. but yeah nice okay. and so with the firm as well the way it's set up am i right in saying that obviously a lot of the clients that you work with are the legal clients of the firm and then the risk advisory works with those clients is that the majority of the business or is it a bit of a mix it's a mix of mix of both okay. we've got clients who are our legal clients in some capacity and then we get involved mm-hmm. we've got a couple of or a few direct clients as well mm-hmm. it's a good mix of both i would say yeah okay mm-hmm. cool and then every one of the questions we always we love to talk about is obviously i'm sure you're dealing with a lot of people who don't the, i guess what you're talking to them about they don't know right? They, they, they don't know what they don't know. Um, they don't know what they need until maybe you tell them what they need. You know, talk to us a bit about that process and some of the clients that you've had to take on a journey, but maybe from the starting point to the, the end point, it was a complete change. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's different by client and it's different by, I guess, the problem they're trying to solve as well. Uh, but I think the crux of it is, you know, to understand really what their pain points are, you know, what is actually impacting their ability to do their, you know, what they're trying to do. Um, and from there, really working backwards to kind of understand how we can help them and how can we resolve that for them. Now, what that looks like as a journey in terms of where Ashurst or myself or the team can play a role, in, you know, it just depends on the problem itself. Uh, but Uh, It's actually, you know, really sitting down with the client. It's really sitting down with the individual to understand, um, you know, how we can assist them, where we, where their issues lie. Is it internal? You know, you know, a lot of our clients, you know, for example, uh, just have an issue trying to get data because, you know, even though they, as a business user, own the data, but they don't necessarily have access to it. You know, it's about providing them some strategies, some tricks, uh, you know, at times as well. You know, I would kind of approach it this way and we can help facilitate that conversation. Um, And at the end of the day, that journey really matters. Um, You know, if you're there with them to help them and it could be a very small problem at the end of the day um, that you're trying to help them with, uh, or it could be a very large one. But the individual remembers you because you were there to help them support and guide them through that journey at the end of the day. So you mentioned there about um, being there to support and one of the things we talk a lot about at Precision Sourcing at the minute is we're obviously out the other side of the pandemic. We're trying to get face to face with clients as much as possible now to rebuild that rapport and relationships. Is that something similar that you're doing, Bikram? Are you trying to get in front of people again? Yes. I, I personally think that really helps yeah. building that rapport, just meeting meeting someone for a coffee or for a lunch or for a drink or whatever it is. Um, having said that, there's, of course, we do have uh, we are very flexible with people working from home or working mm. from office or whatever it is. But I do think just grabbing someone for a coffee and just taking someone out for a coffee helps in building much more rapport as compared to just doing it offline or, or 100%. Virtually. And are you finding clients are up for that or is it a little bit more difficult now to get people out and about? Well, I think the clients are up for it as well. Okay, the clients cool. are in the offices as well, maybe yeah. two days or three days a week. So it definitely helps. Yeah, yeah, we're trying to do that as well at the moment and it's a big push for us as a business, but it's just becoming a bit harder where, oh, you know, my day's in Wednesday and they're in Friday and, you know, just trying to get all the diaries aligned. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that you are seeing the benefit of, of getting out there as well. Um, mm-hmm. But so you mentioned that, so you're statewide, nationwide, you've got people all over the country? We do. We do yeah. have a few offices. We've got Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane... Uh, Canberra, Perth. Oh, okay, yeah, plenty of places. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned obviously the conversations that you're having at the moment. Are, you know, data lineage is one of the buzzwords you're using. Uh, data completion and accuracy. What conversations do you think you'll be having in about two or three years from now? Like, is there anything that you see changing, Avi? Uh, yes. I think um, a lot of clients are going to start talking about Chat GPT. Um. Mm-hmm. So. I think that's probably something that's coming up. Uh, I would, you know, and personally would want to have a conversation about that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think um, a lot of the concepts will probably still remain uh, fairly similar uh, in the sense, you know, uh, regulatory issues and regulatory compliance issues, for example, aren't going to go away. But what will happen is, you know, um, 
uh, as the regulators get more and more complex with their data requests, more and more sophisticated with their data analytics itself, um, you know, our clients will probably have to start thinking a little bit more about how do we stay uh, ahead of the game in that sense uh, of making sure what they're providing, you know, uh, is understood properly by the regulators because it's very easy to kind of get a data set and you mm. put two people at it and they will come up with different outcomes because, and that's the beauty of data, they both might be right in terms of the outcomes they've come up with, but it's just the methodologies and what they've done with it, um, you know, produces slightly different results. So that's that's where the changing landscape is coming, I feel, a little bit uh, in terms of the next couple of years. No, it says, will be a bit from any ideas or differences? But pretty much everything Avi, that you said, I would just probably add on to say, um, from the regulator's perspective, there's a lot of push in getting uh, granular data submitted to regulators. So if you look at traditionally what regulators have been asking for globally is summarized data. So you've mm -hmm. got loan level or customer data level, you take it up a level to say segment, segmentize that mm -hmm. and or cohort, build, build cohorts and submit that information, not granular customer data or loan data to regulators. Mm -hmm. I think that is changing now. So even in Europe, and in Australia, regulators are starting to ask more granular loan mm -hmm. or customer or credit card data and all of that. What that means is the ability to massage your data kind of reduces. You have to ensure that all data is correct, that you have can be traced, uh, you've managed the risks, it's all well governed, so all of mm -hmm. those things. And I only think this will increase uh, in the years to come. Okay, cool. And this leads us to our buzzwords of data lineage, data completeness. <laughs> <laughs> Bing, them, bing, bing, yeah. How again. many times can you say it in this <laughs> podcast? Um, so well, let's talk about, I guess, outside economic factors here. So when we went into 2020 and we had the pandemic, obviously, what we found as a recruitment agency is that people wanted more data. People you know, hired more data people than ever, right? We, we saw that. Um, as we're going into this year, everyone's obviously concerned about recession, more so maybe on a global sense than just Australia. Um, Australia usually seems to manage to keep, keep going somewhat. What would your outlook be? Let's say we do go into the talked about recession. Do you think we'll have a similar situation where clients will be like, you know, we actually need to know our data even more now and the data industry will stay quite buoyant? Or are you already starting to see some companies just tightening the purse strings and, and being a bit more cautious? Maybe we start with you, Bikram, on that one. Sure, I think it's it'll be a short-lived phase. Yeah. I mm. don't see that big of an impact, to be honest, as my personal view. Sure. Uh, there will definitely be a small recessionary phase this year and probably start going up back up later half. Mm. So I don't see that big of an impact. We've, we've had a lot of discussions of late across various various topics, across various class industries. So I don't see that hap impacting us yet. And I think that will stay, even if you go into a rec rec recessionary phase, sorry for that. Um, there's a lot of regulatory requirements mm -hmm. at the moment out there with banks and organizations and other mm -hmm. industries are working on, they have to work on and something. Sure. So I think that demand for data, data, data led regulations is still there and will be there at least for the next yeah. few years. And the money is there still to be put towards these projects from, from what we're hearing. Are you seeing anything different? Have you a similar outlook? Um, yeah, I would agree with that because, um, you know, regulatory compliance is something that is typically not impacted by, you know, global outlook, uh, yeah. you know, uh, timelines are timelines and those are already set. They might move a little bit, but at the end of the day, um, if you have to be compliant from a regulatory perspective, you have to be compliant. Um, that, that doesn't change with a recession as such. Um, now there might be other aspects where, you know, if a client is doing more discretionary spend, um, you know, that, uh, you know, those programs can potentially be put on hold, but at the same time, it's a great opportunity, um, you know, for the clients to kind of steam ahead and, you know, make sure they're making the most of it, you know, to be able to kind of get ahead of their competitors, as an example, or, you know, because a lot of uh, organizations might want to slow down that, but you have an opportunity to actually scale that up. Uh, and really get ahead in some of these areas while the rest of the uh, of the organizations might be scaling back. Sounds like, Emily, if you want to recession-proof your data practice, <laughs> then uh, stay in the regulatory space, eh? Yeah, yeah just uh, grow, guys, and I'll uh, keep, <laughs> keep <laughs> recruiting for you. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting time. I, I saw in the news recently there is the most <laughs> amount of private equity funds available than ever before, but the lowest percentage of deployment versus 
cash available, shall we say. So it's very much a wait and see feel to the market at the moment, which mm. should be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, if at all, I think it's the opposite. I think there'll be a, because if you compare pre-2008 and post-2008, mm. from a regulatory perspective, you only probably had a few handful of regulations pre-2008 that banks and other organizations had to comply to. Probably Basel 1, a bit of Basel 2. But if you look at post-2008, there's been a huge spike in that reg- number of regulations yeah. that banks and organizations have to comply to. And mm. it's purely to safeguard them from what happened in 2008. Mm. So that might even lead to more more regula- or tighter regulatory environment in the, in, in yeah, the coming exactly. years. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Yeah, I was just going to say, we talked about, like, on Friday, we did a strategy day here for Precision, and we talked a lot about, like, how everyone's got a lot of fear around, like, the recession, and it kind of is keeping people in that limbo, but turning it into, like, excitement is really important. Like you said, Avi, like an opportunity and things like that to keep people out of that, like, narrow tunnel vision sort of mind i suppose when growing or not growing well it's still on a personal level as well right yeah, and interest 100%. rates and inflation and everyone's panicking a little bit but um yeah mm. it's been interesting to see how the rate rises have not really affected things that much everyone's just tightened their purse strings and seems mm. to be ticking over so um anyway off topic right um learning and development so one of the questions we always ask um we will at some point put this book library together which we still haven't done but we will one day um <laughs> The book that you've read that's helped you the most could be on a personal level, a professional level, could be in a data perspective, or it could just be a fun book that you read. Have you got any recommendations for people listening as to a book that they might want to read? Um, do you know what? You look ready, Bikram. We'll go to you. I am. Back <laughs> yeah. to I love reading. Okay, cool. And I'm a big time <laughs> reader. I read, non, uh, I read fiction. Cool. I tried reading nonfiction a few times. I've tried it multiple times, actually. The only nonfiction I've managed to read was Sapiens. Right. So I am very bad at nonfiction. So I I'm also really bad at nonfiction. I love fiction and the whole of our office just to sidetrack quickly reads non nonfiction. Oh. Like and they're always recommending books and I'll read this self help book or yeah. read this guy. I'm like, I just don't care. Let me just go <laughs> off into a world by myself, right? So anyway, back to you. Back to you. So I've been reading a lot of fiction, unfortunately not not non fiction, reading Game of Thrones. Then the nice. series again. Mm. I'm a big Murakami fan, big Agatha Christie fan. Nice. So, so Game of Thrones is your top choice for people to go and read. Absolutely, it yeah. is. I mean, like, obviously, that makes sense. I love Game of Thrones. Um, what about you, Avi? Well, um, there was a reason why I was worried because I don't read. Oh, you don't read? Okay, cool. Oh, my God. Are you more of like a listener or? Um, I've never been a reader. I don't really like reading books. It's not something that I necessarily enjoy too much. Um, it's something, you know, all the books that, uh, you know, uh, that Bikram might have mentioned, you know, a lot of them have turned into movies. So I just go and watch the movie. Um, that's my, <laughs> that's it's the my same as me. <laughs> so not a reader. No, I'm not a reader. No, um, only did readings that were necessary for studying. <laughs> But uh, that's about it. So not really a reader. It's not something that I uh, necessarily enjoy. I've, I've started, you know, every now and then I, I've started listening to some podcasts here and there, but um, but nothing much more than that, really, to be honest. Um, I love watching TV shows and movies and things like that, but uh, not reading, unfortunately. Well, before we get to your movie recommendation, it's really nice to hear someone say that because mm. everyone always comes on with, oh, you know, I read this book to learn and I've read this book. And I'm like, yeah. I don't do any of that. Like, yeah. should I be doing that? Is that a thing? Also, you want to switch off from work as well, I imagine. So then it takes you to another place and then you can gear up for yeah. the work the next day. So, yeah. Whatever works for you, you know, free yeah. works for you from switching off for work. That's fine as well. Uh, it, it doesn't work for me, unfortunately. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so movie or, or documentary recommendation for everyone then? Uh, I'm still trying to remember the name. Um. <laughs> must, it must have, have been one. good. Go on, Emily, you can come I'll have, I, You might have watched this already, Avi, but um, Jonah Hill's documentary, The I don't know if it's a little bit more like non-fiction per se, but um, it's called Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z. Mm. And it's about his like, he's interviewing his psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever and he's got parkinson's the psychiatrist and basically it's just them to the entire documentary but it's like you can take away really tangible stuff like if you're struggling with mental health or anything to do with your sort of like crazy world and it's really engaging because obviously jonah hill's a, com- a comedian so um yeah i'd highly recommend personally got you keep a lot out of me it. to watch it and i keep forgetting and i'm, I'm sorry i haven't watched oh, it yet i know brutal. i said i would but 
I'm sure you watched this one. Um, so I'll recommend a TV show, and maybe a lot of people already watched it. But Money Heist um, is is amazing. If you haven't seen it, uh, I would highly recommend. Uh, there's one called uh, Alice in Borderland. I think um, that's also really nice. Um, so yeah, they're on Netflix. Give it a try. Nice. I haven't watched Money Heist myself. No, I've heard I always good see it advertised, and I'm like, should I click that or I not? I don't know. Was that the one that was in Spanish? Was it Spanish first? Maybe it was like done it in Spain. And it then, is yeah, yeah, Spanish one. Uh, and then they have a Korean version, which came out, I think, earlier this year. Um, but the Spanish one is the original. Um, yeah, I've watched both. I've watched the Korean one as well. Um, nice. they're, they're same but slightly different. Uh, but yeah, would highly recommend that. There you go. So you switch off by watching TV and you're more of a reader, but you also watch the TV shows as I well? I watch a lot, yeah. of, lot of series. So were you one of those guys who was ahead on Game of Thrones because you'd read the books and then the TV show came out? Or did you what, read it because of the TV show? I read it because of the TV show. Yeah, I watched okay. the show first, but yeah. then I, I was told that the books are much, much better because yeah. they're detailed. Mm. That's when I started reading them, read them, and I'm reading them again now. So I started reading wow. the books during the series and then got a little bit ahead and then my wife was annoyed because... I was ahead and then you don't get to go back to work it was monday night so tuesday morning at work was like game of thrones morning yeah. everyone was talking about it and you felt like you were missing out a little bit because you knew what was that. so i just stopped reading them and then focused on the show anyway right we're coming up to the end we're nearly 45 minutes there so it's, it's absolutely flown by um so we always at this moment in time just a little moment if there's anything that you think you've missed anything that you really want to talk about anything that's happening in your world this is your opportunity to to say something before i ask the final wrap-up questions Oh, I think we covered it all. Smash it. much covered it all. All right. Yeah. What about you, Avi? Yeah, I think we've covered most of it, Good. to be honest. All right. So let's do the, the final three, um, which are very simply, why should someone work for Ashurst if they wanted to? Why should someone work in your team? And why should someone work for you? It's like a kind of filter down. Um, Bikram, we'll start with you. So I mean, I'm asked myself the same question, the first one especially, and, and the second one as well last year. Mm. Why Ashurst? Why it's so different? And a few things there. The fact that we are legal, le it's a legal consulting model that we have, which is that, as I said, mix of lawyers, say ESG, fin crime, regulatory risk experts, data experts, that's very powerful. That's a very powerful message to go out to the, mm. to the clients with. The second, I think people are very, very warm. And I'm not saying it just for the sake of saying it. It's generally people are lovely um, and they are very smart and very talented. So. That's probably what why I would choose Ashes again if I would had a time machine go back in time mm -hmm. I would do that again. <laughs> uh, the second would be why data and analytics. A couple of things there again. I think we do some really really interesting work. So it's not a not a team that we have which only does say a data science or a data remediation or whatever. We do the entire gamut of data data advisory and consulting work. Mm -hmm. So all the way from data strategy to to analytics, data science, everything that gives someone the flexibility and more often not uh, with the recent new joiners uh, i've seen them as well they want to do different things mm. and experience different projects mm. so people have the flexibility of choosing different types of works they wanted to do under that big data umbrella that's i think the second answer on why ashes data and analytics and the third probability to your question why us i think it's an it's a fantastic team that we have mm. we are growing um, it's a team of roughly 15 ish that we have a bunch of talented people who are not afraid to speak up. They are just guns. Yeah. It's a very powerful team. I put, probably wouldn't put it on the both of us. It's just the team is fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do then to spin this to make it easier. Why would someone want to work for Avi? <laughs> you got me there. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I think Avi, so both Avi and I are very similar. We can cut some parts. Both Avi and I are very, very similar as type in the terms of persons, person we are or leaders we are. I think Avi is a fantastic leader a few different things i think he's open he's open to different ideas people bringing in their own ideas not just following things mm. he's open to being challenged as a leader and he's very very adaptive very respective as well i think and very very polite is very smart and sharp <laughs> no matter whatever he says a very sharp he's got a very sharp mind no matter what anyone says i love that little <laughs> no, thing no, no matter what no matter what he says on the podcast yeah, no matter what he says on the <laughs> yeah, podcast, I think nice. he's, a, he's got a very sharp mind, very polite, very good with clients, and is, mm. is a fabulous leader. There you go. What a great endorsement mm. there. Well, Avi, anything you'd like to add about the team? And then obviously we're going to ask you why would someone want to work for Bikram? Well, I think in terms of the team, um, you know, as Bikram kind of said, 
Um, you know, the, the team is fantastic, made of really smart individuals um, that have a passion for data, um, you know, and it's not just data that's limited to a certain area and scope. Uh, if they have a passion, you know, from data strategy to data governance, to doing automation, to doing modeling and analytics, to doing data science, to doing reporting, um, you know, so they're passionate about data and, and the end-to-end -end data life cycle. Um, and, you know, that's what, you know, someone should be looking forward to if they want to join uh, our team at Ashes because they want to be part of a team that is driven and, you know, they want to learn about data because all of these individuals have a collective knowledge that you can actually learn from them on a daily basis. Um, the other thing that I would kind of say is uh, it kind of leads into that expertise model that I, you know, that Bikram had mentioned earlier as well, uh, which is very, very different to any traditional consulting firm where, you know, you would, you know, you don't necessarily just put the juniors, you know, and you kind of get an engagement moving. Uh, here it is about actually the leaders of the business actually spending a lot more time on these engagements, you know, putting themselves, you know, equally uh, into an engagement to help solve that problem for our clients. So I think that's the reason that I would say, you know, it is something that we want to work, you know, you want to work in and plus the culture. Um, I keep forgetting the culture, but culture is a very important aspect, um, you know. Uh, we strive to, you know, have a really good culture in our team, both within the data team, within the risk advisory practice and within Ashurst as well, broadly speaking. Um, so, you know, that is something that I have personally enjoyed over the last year uh, of being at Ashurst, you know, um, really enjoyed um, the freshness and, and the ability to actually even carve what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, because if you think about it, um, as you kind of mentioned early on, you know, uh, we're still growing, we're still scaling up, uh, etc., you know, that gives everyone the opportunity to actually, you know, build their brand, build what they want to actually focus on, because, you know, nothing is set out, if that makes sense. You know, you have the ability to define what that looks like and how that will work and how you're going to take that to market as an example. And that is something that people in our team love because they don't just work on technical stuff. They work on technical plus people development, plus practice development, plus business development. And for me, that gives everyone a holistic, rounded um, skill set, which mm. will help them make them successful, not just in consulting, but anywhere else that they go. Mm. What brilliant endorsement. And then obviously Bikram specifically? Um, well, Bikram, so it's hard to kind of uh, put it in words, to be honest. Um, you know, Bikram is a fantastic uh, individual, like, you know, uh, from day dot, I think uh, we've bonded, we've connected really well, um, you know, and this is not just because, uh, you know, he's doing a great work, but, you know, he's a great human being and, you know, we really kind of connect and understand each other, uh, whether it is uh, personally or whether it's professionally, um, you know, in terms of the work he does and how he leads people and how he leads his teams is just fantastic. He's you know, always there for the people, um, you know, uh, he's constantly making sure he's in touch with them, having a coffee, you know, just checking in on them. Um, all of those are really, really good qualities, um, you know, to have in a leader, because um, that is something that, you know, generally gets overlooked uh, at times, um, because, you know, we're all busy, uh, you know, uh, but keeping and maintaining that people part, um, you know, is a very, very important aspect of any leader. Um, and that's what I think, you know, Bikram is a great, great addition uh, to the team and he's brought a lot to the team um, and has enhanced the culture of the team as well. Um, not just technical skills, but, you know, just, you know, bringing a positive vibe uh, to the team. There you go. Well, what a bromance nice. has been developing yeah. over the last year. This is lovely to see. And I mean, obviously, it's great for people in your team to know that the leaders are on the same page and pulling in the same mm. direction, right? Um, well, that's about it, Emily. Have you got anything that you'd like to add? You got away with not doing a data joke this time because you said you've run out of them, which um, I don't believe. But apart from I that, I have run out of them. Nah, it's it's slim pickings out there. They're I'll all tell bad. You, I'll tell you that. No, um, nothing to add. I think it's just like awesome to be working and like uh, in I suppose in a good relationship with people like you guys because it is something that I think a lot of people that I rec uh, place or even represent look for. Um, and it's hard to find. So thank you guys. Kudos to both of you then. All right, well, that's everything for today. Thank you both for coming on. Really enjoyed that discussion. Mm. Obviously learning a little bit about an industry I didn't know loads about. And thank you everyone for listening and um, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Always. Thanks everyone.